We'll go to the next lecture then. Uh, we'll talk about the physics a little bit of the turbulent premix combustion. And after that, we want to talk about a little bit physics of uh, non-premix combustion. But there's not, much, there's not much we have to add uh, compared to what we said already. And um, for, for, turbulent, uh, for premix combustion, it's different. Um, I mentioned this um, is more complicated than non-premix combustion. For non-premix combustion, we don't need to say much more. There is, um, again, there's a nice analytic solution here in the notes. And maybe we'll just look at this um, uh, very briefly. Really, I just focus, want to focus on the, uh, on the uh, final result. And then, um, and then after that, we'll talk about uh, modeling of uh, premix and non-premix combustion. So uh, this is an example of a large eddy simulation, actually, of a, of a stationary a gas turbine, you have fuel air mixture here coming uh, from, from the left and then um, there's a swirler here you see you get a, a swirling flow and then you get a flame like this and you see um, you, I mean one of the things you see here in LES uh, that is nice is if you get all these dynamics um, uh, you resolve some of these dynamics of the flow and also of the um, of the um, uh, of the flame so uh, what we want to do here, we want to talk about uh, the scales uh, of turbulent premix combustion. Uh, we'll, we'll review again the, the length scales of laminar flames. We'll review the length scales of um, the turbulence, and then we see how these interact. We, we talked about laminar flames and flame thickness and all these things. And we talked about turbulence now, Kolmogorov scale and, and all that. But these scales now in combustion, they interact with each other. And so that's, uh, that's interesting. That leads to the notion of these regime diagrams, uh, which are very important for, uh, for premix combustion, turbulent premix combustion. And then um, uh, we'll talk about, just like we talked about the laminar burning velocity, we'll talk about the turbulent burning velocity also. And uh, we look at some of the, um, some of the, 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 the fundamental uh, work that was done uh, actually many years ago, very interesting. Uh, very nice uh, work by, um, um, you know, different researchers, Damköhler uh, and so on. So, uh, so these are the scales, and they're just all listed here. We talked about all of these. Um, we have the um, uh, integral uh, turbulent scales. These are integral scales. These are the, the scales of the large uh, turbulent eddies, LT, U prime, and there's also a time scale here you can form. Um, we... You know, often we use k and epsilon here to, to build these, um, uh, these scales. And then, uh, so these are the large turbulent scales. And then here the smallest turbulent scales are the Kolmogorov scales. And these depend here on nu and epsilon. Uh, can be written like this. And then uh, for the laminar flames, we, had, um, we defined the laminar flame thickness as um, uh, d over sl, uh, or like this uh, if we use... Um, uh, unity Lewis number, and then there's a flame time also. It can be written like this or can be written like this. So for each one of these, you can say, uh, basically, you always have, um, you always have two, um, two scales. You have a length scale and a velocity scale. And the time scale always follows from this. Okay? So here, for example, we have a length scale and um, a velocity scale, and um, are these two. And then the time scale you see follows from these two. And, um, and, and same here. And then there are these uh, uh, intrinsic parameter here, parameters here, uh, which are, uh, you, you could say k is the velocity scale. Okay? And then uh, here we have a length scale. And so here the parameter is epsilon. Here the parameter is d. And then um, um, here, well, it, you know, something. Uh, related to these, a little more complicated to see. But now you have these scales. Uh, they would interact. We um, want to see how they interact. And so we define a few non-dimensional groups. The Schmidt number here, nu divided by d. We want to assume for the simplicity here that's equal to 1. We can always replace uh, nu by d and, and vice versa. And then we can define a uh, Reynolds number here. Reynolds number is, the turbulence Reynolds number is written here, I thought I had written it here somewhere, is LT times U prime divided by nu, okay? But um, nu is the same as D, okay? And when we look at this, then D is the same as LF times SL, 
Okay? So I can write the Reynolds number as Lt u prime divided by Lf times Sl. That's interesting because you see now uh, these are ratios here. This is Lt over Fl. This is the ratio of the large scale of the turbulence divided by the flame thickness. And this here is the ratio of the equivalent um, uh, velocity scales. The velocity fluctuation, the large eddies, the velocity of the large eddies divided by the, the flame speed, the laminar flame speed. Okay, so that's the Reynolds number. Uh, we can also define a dump curler number here. Dump curler number is a flow time scale divided by a, um, um, a chemical time scale. We said the chemical time scale is the same as the, as the flame time scale. And uh, so flame time scale uh, here is LF divided by SL. And the flow time scale is LT by U prime. And then this is what we get. And as you see, again, this is, these are these ratios of these quantities, OK, of the velocity scales and the, the, the length scales. And then um, it, it turns out that the Dunkler number in Dunkler number in premise combustion, we often use the Dunkler number. For non uh, for sorry, for non premise combustion, for premise combustion, the Dunkler number is not that relevant because um, really the large scale of the interaction of the large scale of the turbulence and the small scale it has some relevance, but, um, uh, but, but not so much for the, for the actual physics of how these interact. Uh, what's more important is how the small scales interact with the flame. And you can easily see uh, why that is. Um, if I just look at a laminar flame, let's, let's assume I have a laminar flame, and then this would be the temperature it's a function of x in a laminar flame. And now let's say I have um, a, an eddy, which is very large. So this is my flame thickness here, maybe this. OK? Maybe I have now, uh, so this would be LF. And now I have a turbulent eddy, which is much larger. Let's say it goes from here all the way to over here. OK? So does that do anything with the flame structure? No. It will just take the flame structure and move it around, but it doesn't it doesn't interact really with the flame structure. So on the other hand, if you look at the smallest eddies, if now the very smallest eddy, again, is like this, then it's still they don't interact. But if the smallest eddy now is of that size, okay, then it will help mixing in, in the preheat zone, in the reaction zone, or whatever. So the, how the smallest eddy interacts with the flame, that is very important. And so, the, the Karlovitz number here, that is the most important non-dimensional group. Now for non -premix, for premixed turbulent combustion, that compares the time scale of the flame or the chemical time scale with the smallest time scale in turbulence, which is the Kolmogorov time scale. Okay? And so you can write it like this. Um, and I can write it again, you know, using these relations on the previous slide. I can write it like this now, LF over LT um, to the 1 half times U prime over SL to the 3 half. And that again relates it back to these, um, to these uh, same velocity and length scale ratios. OK, here we said, here we look at, um, you see, we have the, um, uh, the flame thickness. I said earlier the flame thickness. But remember when we talked about the structure of flames, we said um, there's an, iner an inert preheat region. That's of the, the, the inner preheat region, that's of the size of the overall uh, flame thickness. But then within this, there's a very thin uh, reaction zone that's much thinner, OK? So now I could also ask the question, how do the Kolmogorov scales interact with this reaction zone, OK? So you could imagine the eddies that are much larger than the reaction zone, but they're much smaller than the flame thickness. And so they do interact here somehow with the preheat region, but not with the reaction zone. Okay? So delta here, that's the, si delta, that's the size of the, um, uh, the thickness of the reaction zone. And so, or L delta, that's the thickness of the reaction zone. And so we can also define this Karlovitz delta, uh, which is the thickness of the reaction zone divided by Kolmogorov length. And it turns out because uh, L delta divided by LF is roughly one tenth. Um, this, this is the same as, um, uh, you know, one-tenth squared uh, times Karlovitz. So, so this, this is typically 100 times uh, this number. 
Okay, but that's just a rough estimate. So now we can use this uh, to build these regime diagrams. Uh, this, is, this is very interesting because now we expressed all these non-dimensional um, groups here in terms of a velocity and a, and a length scale ratio. Um, and so these are the, the, the important um, uh, parameters that describe the flame and the turbulence. Then we can see, um, you know, how these, um, how these uh, parameters look like uh, in this, in these, um, for different values, let's say, uh, of these parameters. So if you take the, so what we want to do is we want to have a plot, um, you, the velocity ratio as a function of the length scale ratio, okay? So the velocity ratio here, you can see, if I bring this here on the other side, then I have u prime over zl is equal to Reynolds turbulent times LF over LT, okay? And so that would be, so this is a log log scale, so that would be, so now I said Reynolds equal to 1, and so then u prime over SL is just LT over LF to the minus 1, okay? So that's a, that's a curve that I can put in here, and then, so this red line here, that's where the Reynolds number is equal to 1. And what this means is in this region, the Reynolds number is smaller than 1, here it's larger than 1, and uh, so this means here it's laminar and here it's turbulent. Now don't get hung up on the equal to 1. Maybe the transition is at Reynolds equal to 10, or maybe it's at Reynolds equal to 0 0.1. Here we're talking about scaling, scaling analysis. We don't, we're not worried with about these, um, you know, constant factors. We're just worried about scaling. Basically, it means if I have... Um, you know, if I'm, if I'm sitting here and it's turbulent and I make this 10 times smaller and I make this 10 times larger, it should still be turbulent, okay? So, uh, if, but if this was laminar, even though this, because this line's in the wrong place, then I make this LT over LF 10 times smaller, make U prime over ZL 10 times larger, then it should still be laminar. We talk about scaling, uh, not, not so much exact values, okay? But anyways, um, so that's an interesting line here already. And then we said... Um, Maybe it's interesting also to look at Karlovitz number equal to 1, okay? Tells you which one is larger, the flame thickness or the Kolmogorov length. Um, and so Karlovitz equal to 1, I can do the same thing, set this here equal to 1, and then um, I have U prime over SL is equal to uh, LF or LT over LF uh, to the one-third or to the two-third. And so, um, to, to the one-third, I'm sorry. So, so I put this... Um, so this here is a line with a slope of one-third. And, um, you know, if this is one, then this also has to be equal to one. So they have to both have to go through this thing. And, um, okay, so now I, I, I subdivide this here in, um, in different regions uh, where, the, where the, in this region here, the Komogov length is larger. We can always say is much, much larger, let's say, just for the sake of getting this uh, straight in our head, is much, much larger than the flame thickness. So this would be the, the case here where, you know, I have a huge eddy here and a very small flame. And this here is the opposite. This is where the, where the, where the little eddies can, can get into this um, region. Then also we have this line here, Karlovitz delta is equal to 1. So this here is, by the way, it's called the Klimov-Williams criterion. Uh, and this here I call this the Peters criterion because he came up uh, with, with this line. And then um, there's another one here which is not so important. Um, this is when u prime uh, is equal to SL, so this just means this here is equal to 1. Uh, that gives you this line, okay? Dunkerler would be just a, a line with a slope of 1, um, but again, the Dunkerler number here is not so important, so we don't, uh, we don't show this here. Okay, so let's look at the different regimes. This here, this regime here is called the corrugated flamelet regime. Um, let's look at this. This is the, the regime where the eddies are much, much larger than the flame thickness. Uh, then this is how this looks like. Um, this is the DNS here we did in this limit. Uh, then the flame, I mean, if the, if the turbulence, or this is an experiment here that was done in this limit. Uh, this here is OH um, uh, PLIF. And what you see here is you see the OH here, and you see no OH here, and you see the flame is very, very thin, okay? The flame is so thin that you, um, that you always get a, even though you have turbulence, you always get a very, very clear interface, okay? This is unburned, this is burned, and in between you have a very, very thin flame, 
Okay? So uh, in, in that limit then, the flame appears really as an infinitely thin surface to the turbulence. The turbulence does not do anything with the structure of this flame. Remember, my smallest eddy goes from here to way over there. And this is the flame thickness. So, so the, the turbulent eddies, they cannot penetrate the structure. They cannot destroy the structure. You still have the laminar structure of the flame. But what the, what the turbulence does is, and that's what you see here, the turbulence will increase the flame area, the flame surface area, okay, like here. And it, you know, will move unburned stuff from here to there and burn stuff from here to there and, uh, and so on. That's what it does, but it does not change the uh, inner structure of the flame, okay? That's the corrugated flame regime. So here, uh, we could imagine that this flame still propagates with a laminar burning velocity, and the influence of the turbulence is just to make the flame surface much, much larger, so that because um, uh, you can imagine the reaction rate is something like the flame surface times the burning velocity that gives you, that gives you volume per time, that's the volume per time you burn, and if, you have, if the surface area is, is very, very large, then also that mass burning rate per unit time would be very, very large. Okay, so that's, that's how we need to think of modeling this. Okay, and then um, we have another regime here. That is the regime now where um, uh, Karlovitz delta here is larger than 1. If Karlovitz delta is larger than 1, that's what we call the broken reaction zones regime. Uh, in that limit, the turbulence is so small that the turbulence is much smaller than even the inner layer thickness. And so what it will do is it will just mix the inner layer, disrupt the inner layer, and so on. Let's say you produce a radical, it will just take it away and move it somewhere else. Uh, in that limit, um, you don't find a Korean reaction zone anymore, and typically flames extinguish. You know, they don't know what to do anymore. Um, typically, that's a regime that, as an engineer, you would avoid. Why would you avoid it? Um, not because you looked at this thing and you said, well, you know, I should stay away from U prime over ZL equal to whatnot and this and that. You would avoid it because if you build a combustor that where the flame always extinguishes, is not a good combustor. You would say, let's go back and um, do something about it, you know, uh, decrease the velocity or make the temperature higher so that the burning velocity is higher or whatever. You would just, by being an engineer, figure out you know, a flame that burns. And um, so, so this regime is something that is, um, in practice, is, is, is hardly ever encountered. Ah, you guys keep me busy in the break, so I have to take my breaks in the lecture. <coughs> so, um, so this is an example, this is from a DNS here of Aspen and uh, Bell at uh, Lawrence Berkeley uh, lab. Um, uh, so this is a very, very high, um, uh, so this, this is low Karlowitz number and this is very, very high Karlowitz number. And you see here on the left you have the burning rate and you see a Karlowitz number here smaller than one. You get really, you get a, a, a thin flame sheet and this temperature, this is how we, the same thing we saw in the experiment. And then here, when you go to very large, um, you, you don't see a thin uh, flame sheet anymore. It seems like things are more, um, more distributed. So, so some, sometimes it's called also distributed uh, reaction zone regime. Okay, then there's the regime here in between. Uh, turns out this is the regime where most of the practical applications live. Uh, this is what we call the thin reaction zones regime. And that regime, uh, you have... Um, the, the smallest turbulent eddies get smaller, smaller, and they're smaller than, so the Karlovitz number is larger than one, means the Komogov scale is smaller than the flame thickness. But at the same time, um, Karlovitz delta is smaller than one, which means the Komogov scale is larger than the inner layer thickness. Okay? So what this means is the inner layer, this is where all the chemistry takes place and all the, you know, the conversion from, um, from fuel to product, which is where the fuel uh, disappears and the hydrogen radical and all of these things. So all the chemistry stuff uh, happens there, but the, the, the turbulence doesn't do anything to that. It just takes that entire layer 
and it moves it around. It moves it from here to there, but it doesn't penetrate this inner layer and mess up the structure that we found. So, uh, on the other hand, um, the, inner, the inert preheat region, uh, that is now uh, controlled by turbulence. You have, um, because the turbulence, the small turbulent eddies, they're smaller than the, than the preheat region, so you have turbulent eddies mixing within the, uh, within the preheat region. So we said earlier on, we said in the preheat region, what's important is the transport, is the transport of, of heat to heat up the unburned reactants, and also the transport of the fuel and the air, you know, uh, into the reaction zone. And so that is now supported by the, um, by the turbulence also, okay? So, so what you have is, chemically, it's, it's, it seems to be still exactly the same, but the um, transport process is enhanced, is made faster by the turbulence, okay? So that's how we, when we, when we think of modeling, that's how we need to think about it. Here's an example. This is also from a DNS uh, that we did. Uh, so here you have um, uh, this the burnt region, this temperature, let's say, and this is the unburnt region. And then you see that you still get a sharp interface here, okay? But in the preheat region, you get, you know, I mean, this is the preheat region is broadened by the turbulence. And you see, for example, if I look in a slice here, you see that the temperature here goes up, goes up, goes a little more up, and so on. So rather than, rather than, you know, having a thin flame like this, maybe I have something that looks like this. Okay, and then the, the reaction zone maybe uh, would still be here. Okay? Uh, so that's, the, that's then the Colgate flame regime. Uh, this here just shows the, um, uh, you know, this, this, uh, uh, DNS here by, by Asplin was done at, at um, different uh, values here of U prime over Z. Uh, this shows where these are. This, this and this one are the ones, I guess, no, we looked at an even lower one uh, earlier. Uh, but these are these four cases. Okay, one's in the thin reaction zones regime, one's just at the border, and two are in the broken reaction zones regime. And you see these, uh, the, so this density, burning rate, and temperature, if we just look at the burning rate, uh, this would be the low, and then here you go uh, higher and higher in, in the Karlovitz number. Uh, then you see here, you still see, if you just look at the burning rate, you still see a, uh, you know, a thin sheet. Uh, here you see also a thin sheet, but it's more corrugated now. Uh, it's not totally distributed, it's just more corrugated. And then here it starts to be more distributed, and, and here even more, okay? And you see the same thing here also in the temperature field. Okay, so now we, we um, thought already about how to model this. First question is, do we need to model this at all? Can we just say the turbulent burning velocity is the same as the laminar uh, burning velocity? And um, so we can uh, look at this here. Um, this is, um, I mentioned this earlier, this is, the, this is from these uh, fits that we had. This is the burning velocity as function of pressure, and then the different lines are different preheat temperatures, okay? This is for iso-octane. Now, um, if you do, if, you, if you're in a, a, a gasoline spark ignition engine, uh, then you have a compression stroke, and in a compression stroke you have a, um, let's say, an isentropic compression. So if you start here at, you know, um, uh, 298 uh, Kelvin and one bar, and then you do this isentropic compression, you end up here at um, 20 bar and uh, what is this here? About 500 uh, Kelvin, uh, no sorry, about 700 Kelvin. And um, uh, this is the burning velocity you get, is like, uh, let's say, what is this here? Uh, 60, 70, 80, okay? And here it was 40. So that's what I said. Um, uh, in one of the previous lectures in, uh, in, an, in this engine, you have strong preheating, and the strong preheating, it will change the, the, the adiabatic flame temperature, and that is very, very important for the burning velocity. The burning velocity goes up. At the same time, the pressure decreases the burning velocity, and so you see the overall effect of this compression uh, is not as strong that you get a totally different order of magnitude. So let's say we have here a burning velocity of like, um, 60, no, 80 centimeters per second. Now on this side here, you see from an engine experiment, transparent engine experiment, um, you see 
the evaluation here of the burning velocity, the apparent burning velocity you get. I don't know how this was measured. Uh, there are two different ways how you can do it. You can either have a transparent engine and just look at how the flame moves, but you can also just from the pressure trace, if you just measure pressure and you assume you have, you know, kind of a cylindrical or spherical flame, you can also, um, you know, infer what roughly the burning velocity is. And so you see here is roughly, um, uh, you know, at this speed here, it's roughly um, 15 meters per second. So here we have uh, less than one meter per second is the laminar burning velocity at these conditions and 15 meter per second is the measured one. So ver very obvious, no, you cannot neglect this. This is a huge effect. It's more like a, this is a factor of 15 or whatever. So it's a, it's a very important thing uh, to measure, uh, to model. Okay, I, I don't actually know what this is, so I'll skip over this. Um, this uh, <laughs> a student put this in, and I was looking at this yesterday to see if it makes any sense, but um, it didn't somehow. So, um, right, so we want to model, we, we, we want to think of how can we model the, the burning velocity. Um, there are different regimes, and what's important here is, and that is really important, as we saw earlier, the, the physics in these different regimes are very, very different, okay? In the one, you kind of have a laminar flame and it's a little corrugated or whatever. And in the other one, the whole flame is messed up. The preheat region is messed up and so on. These things need to be taken into account. This interaction needs to be taken into account. So a model should always know what are the real physics that are going on and then consider these models. So it's very hard uh, at the same time then to have a model that is applicable to anything. You know, you want to have a model that can be applied to non-premix combustion, premix combustion, uh, partially premix combustion. In all of these different regimes, uh, you can imagine it's not an, a simple task to come up with a model like this. You can say, oh, maybe my model shouldn't care about all these microphysics, but I think that would not be right, because you, if you don't consider the microphysics, um, you, you would say they are either not important. Um, yeah, you would say they're not important, but they are important. Um, okay, so, uh, Damköhler, of course, realized this. He was a smart guy. Um, 1940 here. Uh, he came up with models for this, and it's intriguing how how insightful uh, these models were, even in the 40s, where really, I mean, you didn't have much you know, you know, laser diagnostics and, and stuff like this. Uh, I don't think they did DNS at the time, uh, even. <laughs> so I think the DNS they did at the time was with a pencil on the, on a piece of paper or something. So uh, they, they spent less time, spent less time debugging their computer code and, and looking at vast amount of data and spent more time just thinking about it and maybe, maybe we should do that also sometimes. Uh, anyway, so um, he came up with uh, two different uh, models. Uh, he called the one, he called the large scale turbulence limit. We can identify this now with um, what we call the corrugated flame regime. And the second one here is what he called the small scale turbulence limit. And that's what we identify now, what we call now the thin reaction zones regime. So uh, this, is, this is what he did. Um, you, you know, essentially, I tried to prepare you for a start process already. Uh, take the corrugated flame regime. We said the structure of the flame is not disturbed. It still moves with a laminar burning velocity. But at the same time, the surface area is, is largely increased. So um, you have this is the instantaneous flame. It, it burns with a laminar burning velocity, and it has a, a, an area here, uh, which we call AT, A of the turbulent flame, okay? It's unburned, it's burned, let's say. But then um, now we want to have, we want to model this, so we say, we don't know about all the little fluctuations, we just want to say this should be a planar flame that moves now with a, with a turbulent burning velocity, and we need to know what the turbulent burning velocity is. But um, if, if I equate for both of these, I equate the mass burning rate, so the, the model should be such that the, that the planar flame with a turbulent burning velocity, of course, has the same mass burning rate. So if I equate the mass burning rate, I get um, AT times SL. I said earlier that is, has units 
volume per time, so that, that is the volume I burn, um, and then times the density, that would be the mass of fuel I burn per unit time, or the, let's say the mass of, of unburned mixture. And then um, on, on the, the model here is the mean density times ST times A, uh, that also gives me the mass burning rate. So um, if, if you, you see that ST over SL is then equal to the area ratio, and that, that, makes, that makes perfect sense. Okay, if we assume that the density, uh, the density here is, is still the same. Okay, the question now is can I relate this also to my, um, you know, these, the, the velocity. Velocity is something I know usually. Can I relate this to the velocity? And what he did then was he looked at the, looked at the Bunsen flame. Take the Bunsen flame. Um, we said that in the Bunsen flame, we said that the... SL over U prime, uh, sorry, we said SL over U, the incoming velocity, that's equal to the sine of alpha here. And um, so, so, but then sine of alpha at the same time also is this, is this here, this length divided by this, okay? So I could say A, AT, so if, if I assume if I approximate my turbulent flame here, if I approximate this with a little um, Bunsen flame, I could say this area here divided by this area, the nozzle area in that for the Bunsen flame, is the same as U prime, uh, U, the incoming velocity over SL. And because U prime is proportional to the incoming velocity, you could say AT uh, divided by A is equal to or is proportional to U prime over SL. So then ST over SL is nothing else than U prime over SL, or, or the, the laminar burning velocity plus U prime over SL. And you see that then ST, basically, if you forget about this one, if you say this, this has to be a factor much, much larger than one, we said earlier it's 15 or something, I forget about this one, let's say, then ST uh, is equal to uh, U prime, okay? Or it's proportional to U prime. That's very interesting. Um, we'll see later on that that's actually um, is proportional. The, the coefficient of proportionality is roughly equal to two, and and this is um you know it's it's quite accurate actually. Um, this is interesting because uh, you could think if if you take the opportunity, uh, you could think how does a, a piston engine work? It works at very low speed, okay? At very low speed, I want, yeah, I need a certain time for the whole mixture to burn out. But then at very high speed, the combustion process all of a sudden needs to be much faster. How does that work? I mean, why does an engine work at very low speed and very high speed? There are engines that work at, um, you know, 20,000 RPM. The engines that work at 500 RPM. Okay, how does that work? Now, um, U prime actually is proportional to the piston speed. Okay, the faster the piston, you, is very, I mean, is, is easy to imagine because that's the only velocity scale you have now. Um, the, is the imposed, you know, is, is imposed by the engine uh, is the piston speed. And the U prime, that's proportional to the piston speed. Okay, so if the piston is much, much faster, higher RPM, then U prime is much, much larger, and the flame burns much, much faster. The flame always knows this is how fast the piston is. It's fast, I need to burn faster. Isn't that beautiful? Wondering if um, Otto was thinking uh, of that, but apparently not because it's 1940 and the engine had been running before. Uh, but but you know, sometimes you get lucky in life. But uh, this is very interesting. So if we then compare that with experiments, uh, this, is a, this is a form that's often used uh, here. ST over SL uh, is an empirical form uh, that's often used um, in models is 1 plus some constant times U prime over SL. Um, this here, by the way, the one we always add this um, if, if there's no turbulence. Okay, in the limit where there's no turbulence, U prime is zero, and then ST should be equal to SL. Okay, so that's why we just add this uh, 
1 at the end to satisfy, satisfy that limit. Um, but that shouldn't be important for very strong turbulence. So um, if, if we do this, so, typical, so the exponent n here varies. Um, now for us here, it's equal to uh, 1. Uh, and if you, if you make it 1, then you see this is what it is. So for, uh, the, for this regime here, uh, you see this linear function actually is, is, is really good. But then for large v prime over s l, uh, you see, you know, it, it bends off and, and is not accurate anymore. So that is really when we get to the limit that Karlowitz number now becomes larger than 1, then, then uh, this is not correct anymore. Okay? Uh, these, no, I think, uh, I don't know, actually. Um, uh, I think these are all just different experiments. And you see, there's a lot of scatter in these experiments. And that is because sometimes it's very hard to control. These might be um, experiments from the group of um, Derek Bradley in Leeds. And they have a, also a spherical combustion chamber. It's turbulent. Uh, or, or let's say you have a, a kind of a spherical flame, turbulent. This one here in the... Uh, uh, Princeton also. And uh, so you measure what's going on. But um, if you start burning a flame, then all the things we said here, they're really only true if you have kind of equilibrium turbulence. It's not when you start a shear flow and you ha don't have turbulence. Uh, we say, you know, the turbulence is kind of proportional to the velocity gradients. Well, that's not true in the beginning. That's only true when once you have an established you know, flow where the dissipation and uh, the, the energy transfer and the energy production is all in equilibrium. Same with a flame. Um, if you have, if you start, let's say you, you have, a, you, have um, you know, unburnt mixture and then you start a flame, you ignite a flame and you have a little flame kernel, that's not turbulent yet. It, it first needs to interact with the, so these, um, with the turbulence. So the initial conditions for these are not always all that well controlled, I think. And so, you know, that's why you get a lot of scatter. So we shouldn't, we shouldn't see, <laughs> I mean, this is a trick here. In a plot like this, uh, you see the, the points are all over the place. If I want to see that this linear line is right, I can see it. If I want to see that this curved line is right, I can also see that. So um, the other thing is this, and, and we'll see that in a minute. This here plots st over sl as function of v prime over sl. We will see in a minute that in, in this regime uh, the, where Karlovitz number is larger than 1, it's not only the velocity that's important, it's also the length scale that's important. That is not considered here. So, so this is another reason why you get so many, um, uh, uh, such a big scatter, because this, there's, you have two parameters, but this shows it only as function of one parameter. So this should be conditioned then also on the value of the second parameter and maybe then you know, you would see that uh, this here is something that really should be in the, these experiments, something that really should be in the Colgate film regime, and these should really be in the film reaction film regime and so on. Okay? Okay, so um, then, so that was the Colgate film regime, a model for the Colgate film regime. Now, this is what Dumkula did for the, what he called the small scale turbulence regime. He also realized in that regime, maybe the, fl the flame structure, you know, it doesn't change, but the transport, um, the, so, or he assumed the chemical time scale doesn't change, but the transport um, is enhanced. And so in laminar flames, we said SL is equal to the square root of D over, over chemical time scale. And now, this is interesting, we can say, okay, um, so that's what he did. He said, okay, uh, the, now, if, if the transport is now really a turbulent transport, then I should replace d by dt. And if the chemical time scale, well, he said that shouldn't be changed, maybe. And so if I replace the chemical, uh, the, the chemical time scale, it stays the same. And for the turbulent burning velocity, I just take the same scaling relation, but I replace the diffusivity by a turbulent diffusivity. And if you do that, um, you can bring it back here to you know, these, these quantities. dt is just like this, is um, u prime uh, times lt, and, um, you know, times some coefficient, and then tc I can write like this, and then again I have this 
as function of this ratio. And you see that this here actually um, is, the, um, uh, is the Reynolds number. This is the turbulence Reynolds number. OK? So, um, well, you can combine these two. In, um, and, and what's important here, that's what I just said. You see, ST in this regime, it depends not only on U prime. It also depends on the, the length scale ratio. So a formula like this can actually not be right. I mean, the N and C, they kind of have to depend on the length scales. Then, then it can be right, of course. But, but if these are constants, then in that regime, uh, this, this cannot be right. Or not be general or whatever. So um, you can combine these two limits uh, in, in one formula. This is here by uh, Peters. Uh, so if you take this, you see this is a quadratic uh, solution of a quadratic equation uh, depending on the length scale ratio and the velocity uh, scale ratio. And if you take this here in the limit of large Dumkeller number, then uh, you get this. And if you take it in the limit of very small Dumkeller number, Dumkeller number goes to zero, uh, then you get this. And so that, you know, that shows that then you, this, this formula, it recovers both uh, the Dumkeller small scale and uh, large scale limit. And now if you compare that with experiments, then again, um, these are experiments now plotted as function of Dumkeller number. The nice thing is you can rewrite this if you take the same formula here, this st over sl. If I write this as st over u prime, then I can write it as a single function of a single parameter. Of course, because I have two parameters, I put one on the left-hand side, you know, and, and there's only one left. So I can plot then this uh, st uh, minus sl here divided by u prime. I can plot this as function of the Dumkeller number, uh, and that now should be, you know, let's say a universal function. All these individual points here, these are individual experiments, and you see again there's a lot of scatter, but if you take the conditional average here now at each Dumkeller number, then you get these big uh, points, and then um, this black line here, the solid black line, that is this model, and you see the model is not so bad. It's, it's actually pretty good. Um, using here, uh, this is interesting also, using here uh, these coefficients, this I said this earlier, proportionality coefficient is equal to two. Uh, that's actually pretty good. And here, uh, proportionality coefficient is actually equal to one. Uh, that's, that's also pretty good. So uh, you see this is the large scale limit. Uh, you see how this asymptotes to this value of two that we're just looking at. And in the small scale limit, you get this, um, this nonlinear uh, behavior here. OK, so that, um, that's, that's kind of the, you know, so something about the physics of uh, non-premix, of, oh, sorry, premix turbulent combustion, where we have uh, two different regimes, large scale and the small scale regime. And um, uh, we identified, using the Karlowitz number as a parameter, we identified these different regimes um, in this regime diagram where we said that the different regimes are the interaction of the smaller scales of the turbulence with the flame, either the small scale is much, much larger than we're in the corrugated flame regime, or it's small enough that it penetrates into the preheat region, but not in the reaction zone. That is the, um, uh, that is the, the, the thin reaction zones regime. Uh, and then we have the, if the, the turbulence uh, scales become smaller, smaller, then they might enter the uh, inner layer or the, the, the inner layer becomes thicker because you go more lean or something. Um, and then this is what we call the broken reaction zones regime. So why did I say earlier, why did I say the, the uh, thin reaction zones regime, that's where you find typically, you know, all the, or most of the applications? Any thoughts? Yes, stable, but that could also be corrugated uh, flame regime. That would also be stable. No local extinction and things like that. No? Um, no, no, I mean, the, what, you, what you could measure is not how people design... Right, so if you want to increase the, the, the mass burning, the mixing, you want, 
the turbulence to be stronger and stronger and stronger. But you make it too strong, then the flame goes out. Okay? So what you do as a designer, you would try to make a, a, a combustor such that you get the highest possible mass burning rate at still stable combustion. Okay? And that is right in this region where you are just below maybe uh, the transition to the broken reaction zone regime, which is right in the thin reaction zone regime. Yeah, so it just burns faster, um, but, but, but not so fast that, uh, that it will extinguish. Okay? So, um, let's move on to the next lecture then. So, for non previous combustion, people have also developed these um, regime diagrams, but they're not, I mean, uh, this is something I should, uh, should mention. This uh, originally was called the Borghi diagram. Um, it was, um, uh, you know, invented by uh, uh, Professor Borghi from, uh, from France, and um, others had uh, different diagrams. The reason why this one was so uh, successful is you can imagine you can put different um, quantities on your axis. Using the velocity and the length scale ratio, that was ingenious because that's what people understand. We do understand um, velocities and we do understand length. That's, we have an intuitive feel for this. So this is why people always look at this Borghi type diagram, which then later on was modified by Peters uh, with, his, um, uh, with his second uh, Karlovitz delta criterion. Um, uh, is this the best way to look at it? No, it's not the best way to look at it. There are better ways to look at it, at least, um, I think, because we have our own uh, diagram that we, uh, regime diagram that we developed for LES. Uh, maybe maybe we'll sh I'll show this later on. I'm not sure if it's in the notes, um, where we use the Karlovitz number as one of the uh, axes. That makes a lot more sense, because really all we did when we discussed this, we didn't discuss U prime larger or smaller. We just discussed the Karlovitz number. The Karlovitz number really is the quantity that, that, that is important for the physics, okay? So, um, well, that, that um, we might look at this um, uh, later on. Anyways, um, so for non previous combustion, people also have looked at these, um, have started uh, talking about these regime diagrams, but they're not, they don't have the same uh, meaning. Um, here we said, um, in whatever limit we are, we need to think a lot to come up with these um, burning velocity models, uh, even in, in simple, you know, if we make simplifications. Uh, on the other hand, for, for, for non-premise combustion, uh, it's not so hard. Um, we say, well, if a simple limit, infinitely fast chemistry, then everything is just determined by mixing, okay? Just solve the mixture fraction equation, maybe the variance equation, and everything's good. So um, here we don't have much more to add about the, the physics. Uh, there's, there's one thing that, um, uh, th that uh, I thought might be interesting here, which is the, um, uh, the flame length of, uh, of non-premixed flames. And uh, what's interesting is that if you change the, the, the Reynolds number, then uh, the question is, what happens with the flame length? What do you think? Uh, what happens with the flame length if you increase the Reynolds number? So how do I increase the Reynolds number? I just increase the flow velocity. Okay, how does, the, how does the flame length change? If I increase the velocity, you think it gets shorter? Shorter is what he says. And um, who thinks it gets longer? So if I decrease the velocity more and more and more until it's almost no fuel is coming out, you think it gets longer and longer? You think it stays the same or gets shorter? Shorter. So we have, um, did anyone say it stays the same? No. Um, let's see what, what our burner does. Think of, um, okay, so we can even, uh, I don't know, this used to have a thing here to adjust it, but. So let's start small, okay, S small flow rate is very short, okay, increased flow rate, it gets longer, so some of you were right, 
and then I increase even more. And um, I, I think I can increase it more. It, it doesn't really get turbulent anyways. But um, anyways, so let's look at uh, this was just for, you know, like taking a little break for you guys. Um, so there is an analytic solution for the flame length. And because we said, um, you take the cigarette lighter, for example, because we said, um, well, infinitely fast chemistry, uh, it will burn just at stoichiometric. And then because of mixing, stoichiometric will look like this. Up here, it will be all very, very lean because the fuel has all mixed with the air. So where the stoichiometric uh, surface crosses the, the center line, you know, that's, that's kind of the flame length. That's a good measure for the flame length. So in that case, then, we only need to uh, look, at the, uh, look at the mixer fraction field. This, by the way, is, um, um, is a candle. And here, by the way, also you see the blue, the, you know, the blue reaction zone up to the point where this gets very light. Uh, and this flame in microgravity. So microgravity, it's just a, a sphere. Uh, in a sense, but then, but this is candle, so it's buoy this is buoyancy dominated. If you have a, um, a flow that is um, uh, momentum dominated, so you have a flow coming out like this, then uh, it might be, the buoyancy might not be so important. So anyways, um, we have continuity, momentum equation, mixer fraction equation, and really all we, need, we want to do is we want to uh, determine the mixer fraction field. And then, um, Oh, I'll go through this very quickly here. Um, we make some simplifications, and we introduce, so, so we know or we assume there's a similarity solution, and so we introduce similarity coordinates here. Uh, zeta here, that would be um, a coordinate measuring the actual distance um, along the center line, let's say, or, or in downstream direction. Eta here is a radial coordinate, but you see it's a, it's a similarity coordinate now. And... Um, so then, as we said last time, analysis is always good to introduce stream function because then the uh, continuity equation goes away. So here we introduce stream function again, um, and then it you know, satisfies continuity. Um, then we have transformation rules. We transform the system of equations into these um, uh, similarity coordinates. Uh, then we get an equa then, uh, let's see, this is just transformation rules. Uh, this is the non-dimensional stream function, uh, transformation rules, and then we get an equation like this here. And then a simple trick, so you have a lot of terms, simple trick. Uh, now we have to say if, um, if a similarity solution should exist, then this, um, this stream function cannot be a function here of zeta anymore. That's the condition for, so, so basically the solution the, the, the non-dimensional solution now cannot be a function of the nozzle distance anymore because the similarity solution says the scaled solution has to be the same everywhere in the field, okay? So, uh, so that means this term here goes away. I end up with a simple equation here uh, is this. And then um, let's see, I can do the same thing for the mixer fraction. Here this is the omega. That's the normalized mixer fraction. And I can solve these equations analytically, and I get this. This here is then the, the stream function. Uh, so basically, velocity field, this mixer fraction field. I get these two uh, relations here. You see, they look fairly simple. Uh, I get these uh, gamma uh, constants here. Gamma, these are integration constants, which have not been determined yet. Uh, I can determine these by um, the, 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 this constant. I can determine this for the momentum field just from momentum conservation. I know the momentum I feed in, and I know momentum is conserved, so I can determine it everywhere else. This is then this gamma. I plug this in, and uh, I do the same thing here. Um, mixer fraction also, uh, mixer fraction flux also needs to be conserved. I plug, so this is the constant I get from this, uh, and so I, I plug this in, and here's my final solution. So, so ZA, this is the, the mixer fraction on the center line, uh, that is equal to this here, where the zeta, that was the distance on the center line, if I set zeta equal to L, or I set ZA uh, of Z equal to zero, um, uh, or uh, uh, stoichiometric, uh, then I can compute the L 
uh, from this, and um, it gives me this. So, so this is the final result here. Uh, this would be valid for a laminar flame without buoyancy, so a momentum-dominated flame. And all we want to look at is um, you know, how this looks like. So first of all, you see that the flame length for this laminar flame, um, you see, so I take L divided by D, D is the nozzle diameter, L divided by D is then proportional here to the Reynolds number, okay? So the larger the Reynolds number, the larger the flame length. That's exactly what we saw. And actually it's linear. If you double the speed, then you double the flame length, okay? Interesting result. Um, you also see that it depends on this transport coefficient. C is uh, this chapman rubezin parameter we had yesterday also. It depends on these stoichiometrics. These stoichiometric, you can modify this by diluting the fuel, for example, or you know, enhancing the uh, oxygen in the air or something. That would change uh, Z stoichiometric. And for different fuels, it's different also, but it's not so much different. So, um, you know, maybe um, uh, for uh, burning fuel in air, it's, it's very similar for different hydrocarbon fuels. Okay, so we see this is. Um, but is this the full story? No, because we said we want to talk about uh, turbulent combustion also. This was for laminar flames. And um, so, so what we see here is L divided by D is proportional to the Reynolds number. Uh, if we look at, so this here is a plot that comes from experimental data. And what you see here is in, in the, for small Reynolds number, uh, you see this linear relation here is quite good. We also saw this here basically in our little experiment. Okay, now we can look at the turbulent flames in the same way. Um, you see in turbulent flames, we assume here the spreading rate is linear. Uh, and uh, this is my little example here. This is a German soccer coach, by the way, or used to be a German soccer coach um, in a game, very nervous, smoking cigarette. And you see this is a turbulent jet here. Uh, <laughs> no, I mean, seriously. You see, this is, these are just two linear lines. I just put these lines there. This is perfectly linear, OK? The linear, linear relation here just comes from basically momentum conservation. Momentum conservation uh, and, and um, uh, turbulence leads to the fact, uh, uh, turbulence scaling leads to the fact that this here is, um, is linear. And, and you see, it's, it's not, a, not a bad assumption. OK. So now we have the same equations, except that here, instead of the molecular, we have the turbulent uh, viscosity. So the equations here are compared here with the lamina. They look exactly the same. So what we can do is we can just take the, basically the final solution, or almost the final solution, just replace the molecular viscosity with the turbulent viscosity. Um, you see also here the similarity coordinates. They're basically the same, except they're defined here with the mean quantities uh, and so on. And um, so finally, let me just uh, go to the final result. Um, right, so, so this is where we end up uh, here again with this um, Z at the center line. And we see now this is basically all the same, turbulent Schmidt number and so on. But here now we have the eddy viscosity instead of the um, molecular viscosity. So in the laminar case, you see this was U times D divided by nu, that is the Reynolds number. But here we have u times d divided by nu t. Now nu t is, is not the molecular viscosity, okay? We said earlier, nu t is, is u prime times lt. But u prime, to some degree, is proportional to u, to the jet exit velocity. If I make the jet exit velocity five times larger, I will also make u prime, the turbulent uh, um, fluctuation five times larger. And same with L. L also, the, the integral length scale, the length scale of the turbulence, that scales with the um, nozzle diameter. If I make the nozzle five times as large, my turbulence scales will also be five times as large, okay? So replace this here by u uh, naught times d, and you see this here actually, um, you know, these, these drop out and, uh, you know, it's just a constant. So it turns out from, so this, this is what this is. Uh, turns out from experiments that this ratio here is, is roughly constant, uh, you know, which is, which is uh, easy to understand, and it's roughly a factor of 70. And so you see the turbulent, while the lamina case uh, was proportional to the Reynolds number, once it's turbulent, um, 
it's, it's actually, it does not depend on the Reynolds number anymore. The Reynolds number doesn't appear here. Uh, it's constant, okay? It's interesting. So if I, have a lamin if I have a flame like this, I increase the Reynolds number. It becomes linearly longer. Up to a certain point, I've transitioned to turbulence. Actually, it goes down here a little bit, and then it stays constant. So everyone was right. Somebody said it gets shorter. Well, just say you said uh, you meant this, uh, this piece but, uh, here. Yeah. <laughs> also, in your uh, experiment for student uh, motion, you also increase the fuel uh, mass to space. So you increase the fuel that you release. So, of course, you increase the length. No, because in the turbulent case, I do the same thing. I don't increase the length. The fuel, I'm, I, this was, uh, you said I didn't say that, but... Um, all I do is I increase the velocity, right? And the governing equations, they know that there's more fuel, right? Because, you know, I have um, a flow of z equal to 1 at a higher velocity now. So the mass flow rate of the of fuel is higher. But if you go to the turbulent regime, uh, you increase this, you increase this, it doesn't change anymore. It just scales then with the, um, uh, basically with a nozzle diameter. That's all. Nozzle diameter, stoichiometric air ratio, and, you know, these you could say they're roughly equal to one. Um, you know, so you can actually compute, you can compute this roughly. And look at a, you know, if you have a turbulent flare somewhere, uh, see if it roughly uh, holds like this. Okay? Okay, good. So, um, I think that's, that's all I wanted to say about this. Um, oh, we don't need to uh, discuss this. So that's all I wanted to say about this. Maybe we'll take a break now, and then um, we'll meet um, back in 10 minutes from now. <laughs>